This is the second of a two-part lecture by Professor Farah Ahmed in a series entitled Using Judicial Review to Promote Access to Justice for All. It was organized by the Carabona Network, the Faculty of Law, the UE Mona, Mona Law, and the Faculty of Law, the UE Rights Advocacy Project, URAP. In this presentation, Professor Ahmed uses insights from Indian public law to reflect on access to justice for impoverished and disadvantaged litigants. She looks at a range of issues, including standing rules, the epistolary jurisdiction, the use of amicus, creeping mandamus, structural injunctions, and quasi-legislative orders. Okay, so I just wanted to recap a little bit what we talked about last week. So in our last session, we talked a fair bit about the significance of this discussion as a South-South exchange. And I just want to reiterate a little bit about what I said when we met about the purpose of this discussion. So some of you who may have been here last week, you'll, you'll recall that I said that I hope that this comparative discussion, that it may be useful in prompting us to better understand our own jurisdiction. So each of you I know for, are from different jurisdictions. I hope that it is useful in prompting you to think more about your own jurisdiction, because I think comparison helps us see what is peculiar, what's unique, what's different about our jurisdiction, at the same time appreciating what's shared and what's universal. So that for me is a big hope, a big aspiration for this discussion. But I think the biggest uh, advantage of comparative discussions are that it helps us imagine, it helps us be creative, it helps us think beyond what the law is to what it could be. So I really, you know, want to think about this discussion as a continuation of our aim in opening up the spaces for imagining the possibilities, imagining the potential for law, given the shared challenges and questions that we face in our particular jurisdictions. And I want to emphasize again that, um, because I think this is really important, that my aim is to try to help open up that conversation about what's possible, that conversation about what we can do by being creative, by being imaginative. And my aim is certainly not to prescribe what would be best for your jurisdictions, because I certainly don't have the expertise to do that. And as we talked about last week, there are really important differences between India and your jurisdiction. So my aim is very much to use my jurisdiction and the story of my jurisdiction that I'm going to tell as a way to prompt your reflection, your creativity, your imagination about what might be possible in developing the law where you are. So like last week, I think I said, what I want to focus on is what are our shared challenges? What are our shared questions? What are the, the problems and issues and questions that we shared? And given those shared challenges, I want to talk to you about the response in India, hopefully with an eye to getting you to think about what are the possible responses in your jurisdictions. So the shared challenges, the shared questions that I want to focus on today are basically two. Given our shared challenges of impoverishment, deep inequalities, inadequately resourced governments and administrations, given these shared challenges, how can we as lawyers, as community workers, as members of the public, as judges, as lawmakers, as, as people who are involved in the legislative process possibly, how can we as a range of diverse people working in different ways towards social justice, how can we ensure access to justice for impoverished and disadvantaged litigants? And how can we reflect the interests of the public in judicial review? This for me is the, our first shared challenge that I wanna talk about. And the second shared challenges is, sorry, the second shared challenges 
again, how can we from our diverse um, positions, you know, some of us may be lawyers, some of us may be community workers, social workers, et cetera. How can we all effectively guarantee legal rights and entitlements? How can we, how can we contribute to the effective um, guarantee of legal rights and entitlements? So these are the two questions that I want to focus on today. So I'm going to talk about India's answers to those questions. That is, how have Indian judges, how have Indian lawyers, NGO workers, how have members of the public, and, and I really want to stress this because, um, you know, as Tracy said before, you know, she raised the question of junior lawyers, and as I said, junior lawyers have been key, but equally, members of the public who have had no legal training what, whatsoever, they have made really key contributions to Indian jurisprudence and practice as well. So I want to talk about how this these range of people have contributed to some really innovative legal developments. So on the first question of um, how, to, how to ensure access to justice for impoverished and disadvantaged litigants and reflect the interests of the public in judicial review, we see that um, there have been developments in India around extremely open standing rules. And I'll talk about that. There have been developments around the loosening of procedural requirements, including what's been called, and I'll explain this, the epistolary jurisdiction. There have been developments around relaxation of evidentiary and procedural rules, including around fact-finding. And there has been a reliance and this has been you know, quite important in the court's practice, the use of amicus curiae. So I will take each of these in turn and talk about, um, talk about how, what the Indian approach to this question has been. And on the second question of how to effectively guarantee legal rights and entitlements, there's been a number of legal innovations. One we call creeping mandamus, uh, and it's a kind of remedy that I'll talk about. And there are a couple of other remedies that have been really, you know, really important in public interest matters. Um, there are remedies that are that are called structural injunctions, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And there's um, a kind of remedy that you might find quite radical in some ways, which I'm describing as a quasi-legislative order. This is not what the court calls it, but this is the term that I give to it. And I want to talk as well about the importance of the role that the right to information has played in uh, effectively guaranteeing legal rights and entitlements in India. Okay, so I'll just take each of these developments, each of these responses in Indian jurisprudence in turn. So probably a really important development, which is quite well known because in Indian public interest standing rules, they've become globally influential as a way of representing the public interest in litigation. So I'm going to talk about our public interest litigation jurisprudence using a very well known case called Bandhuwa Mukti Mocha. So in this case, the court says, um, and I'll just read from the extract that you have. It says, this court has laid down that its jurisdiction can be invoked by a third party in the case of violation of the constitutional rights of another person or determinate class of persons who by reason of poverty, helplessness, disability, or social or economic disadvantage is unable to move to the court personally for relief where the public injury was suffered by an indeterminate class of persons, any member of the public having sufficient interest can maintain an action. So quite early on, the court was willing to say, well, when you have a situation where there are people who, because of impoverishment or helplessness or vulnerability, they can't move to the court, someone else can, can stand in their place. And where you have a situation where it's not an injury to a particular person, but an injury to the public at, la at large, again, you can have someone else representing the public in those kinds of cases. And as I said, this kind of public interest jurisprudence, it's been influential actually globally. 
So you have the development around standing, but alongside the broad public interest standing rules, the Indian Supreme Court has also relaxed procedural requirements and created what has been called its epistolary jurisdiction. And I've seen some references to these developments in India in Caribbean legal scholarship. So some of you might have, have encountered this. In Bandhua Mukti Morcha, the court says again, where a member of the public acting bona fide moves the court for enforcement of a fundamental right on behalf of a person or class of persons who on account of poverty or disability or socially or economically disadvantaged position cannot approach the court for relief. Such member of the public may move the court even just by writing a letter because it would not be right or fair to expect a person acting pro bono publico to incur expenses out of his own pocket for going to a lawyer and preparing a regular writ petition for enforcement of the fundamental right of the poor and deprived section of the community. So there have been, I mean, so this is one case, but really there have been many, many cases now where letters and postcards are converted to writ petitions in Indian courts. So this is not something at all um, unusual. This is now pretty much standard practice um, in, in Indian courts, in the Indian Supreme Court in particular, when there is a public interest matter and these conditions obtain. So in Bandhua Mukti Mocha, this is a good example, a classic kind of case where the epistolary jurisdiction, the use of postcards and letters is considered appropriate. The organization was dedicated to the cause of releasing bonded laborers in the country. So really, really impoverished, very, very vulnerable people. And this organization, they addressed a postcard to a Supreme Court judge, Justice Bhagwati. And in the postcard, they allege that quarries around the country were exploiting forced or bonded laborers under inhumane conditions which breach their constitutional rights and their other rights. And so this is really the classic kind of a case where you think, yeah, a postcard is going to do it. The court is going to just accept a postcard. And I want to flag this now because... This is, this is the classic kind of case of PIL, but as we'll see in a bit, PIL has, jurisprudence has moved on a little bit uh, from here. So I want you later to compare the kinds of cases that I'll talk about to this classic case, which had to do with bonded laborers. So we've talked about the rules of standing, we've talked about the epistolary jurisdiction, and so you'll see the, the extent of flexibility that the court has developed already in, in those two developments. And the other kind of um, flexibility that the court has shown is around other evidentiary and other fact-finding matters. So... Um, besides, you know, the, the use of postcards, besides the use of broad standing rules, the, the jurisprudence allows for relaxation of other procedural requirements, so particularly when it's difficult for litigants or those representing them to prove the facts they need to establish, the court will basically not force them or not require them to prove those facts. And what the court will do instead is it will appoint a fact-finding mission. So again, just going back to the case of Bandhua Mukti Mocha, what the court is saying is, well, the poor and the disadvantaged, they can't possibly produce relevant material before the court in support of their case, especially when an action is brought on their behalf by a citizen acting pro bono. So even, that's, even for that citizen, it would be almost impossible for him to gather the relevant material and place it before the court. And then the court is saying, well, if we were to adopt a passive approach and if we were to decline to intervene in these cases because relevant material hasn't been produced before the court, fundamental rights would remain merely a teasing illusion as so far as the poor and disadvantaged sections of the community are concerned. 
And it's for this reason that the Supreme Court has evolved the practice of appointing commissions for the purpose of gathering facts and data in relation to a complaint of a breach of a fundamental right made on behalf of the weaker sections of society. So the court is basically saying, okay, we've you know, yes, you know, we're giving people standing. Yes, we are, you know, accepting postcards and we're accepting letters. But then we have this other problem of if you don't have resources, if you if you don't have, um, you know, the money to go off and, and gather and, and put together a good factual record, then how are you actually going to make your case? Okay, well, the, our solution is rather than require you to provide these facts, we are going to appoint a fact-finding commission that will do that again um, without any cost to the litigants. And just to give you an example of how those fact-finding commissions work. So here, this is a different case where the court is saying they need to, so basically it's a situation involving workers in a quarry and the court is saying it needs a socio-legal investigation into the living conditions of workers in the quarry, right? So under normal conditions, it would be up to the workers or those representing them to put on record the facts about their living conditions. But instead here, what the court does is it appoints someone from a prestigious university, the Indian Institute of Technology, to undertake this investigation. And also the court is saying, is saying to the state, that is the government, they're asking them to cover this person's expenses. So this is a fairly typical way in which the court will use fact-finding commissions, will create a fact-finding commission in order to establish facts that have to be established for any case. So the fourth and final kind of development, or I mean, it's not a new development, but it's a really a response of Indian jurisprudence to the problem of access for impoverished litigants that I want to talk about is the court's practice of inviting particularly senior members of the bar to serve as amicus curiae. And you will find that in, uh, you know, really a lot of members of the bar are called upon to serve as amicus in public interest matters. And you can kind of understand that that would happen given that there are so many public interest matters that have been heard um, in the Indian courts. Now, this practice, I think, and there might be, you know, different opinions on that in India, but I think this practice has really increased the profile and the prestige of public interest legal work and really helped poorly resource litigants. So I think, you know, it is now a matter of great prestige, a great importance to be asked to, to serve as an amicus. And I think that's overall um, been a good thing. And I, I think there's this really heartening sort of quote from our former Chief Justice who says, the most busy lawyers who charge large fees, if called upon to appear as amicus curiae in any such matter, leave every other work and without charging a single rupee, put in their best effort in a PIL matter. And I think that is fair to say and it'd be interesting to, to hear um, any reflections you have, but I think that is a fair assessment of how the bar has responded to this need for amicus. I think rather than saying, oh, right, that's going to take away my time from X, Y, and Z matters, it is just taken very, very seriously if someone is uh, appointed as amicus. So just to summarize uh, the four approaches to ensuring access that I've just spoken about, I've talked about the court jurisprudence on public interest standing. I've talked about the court's epistolary jurisdiction. I've talked about the relaxation of procedural requirements with respect to fact finding. And we just talked about um, the role of amicus in Indian courts. So, I want to talk, though, you know, because I don't want to present a unduly rosy picture. So there are these developments, which, as I said before, they've been quite influential. And it's one of the things that Indian jurisprudence is known for. But there have been serious concerns and criticisms about public interest litigation jurisprudence in India. And 
one of the key ones is that when PIL, when public interest litigation jurisprudence <clears throat> first developed in India, it was focused, as we just saw in the cases like Bandhua Mukti Morcha, on the most impoverished people. But today we see a lot of criticism of the court's PIL jurisprudence because there's been a shift away from impoverished litigants um, towards um, nationalist, that is, you know, narrowly nationalist, highly politicized, or what we think of as middle class concerns. So it's less about the most impoverished and more sometimes about politicized issues or what we might think of as middle class concerns. And really, maybe the harshest criticism that can be made, many are making, which is that PIL is actually now used not to vindicate individual rights or fundamental rights, but is rather used to restrict or curtail individual rights or to achieve political goals that are blocked by normal political roots. So you couldn't get this law passed, well, you file a PIL. Or to stymie existing legal proceedings to get in the way of some other legal proceedings that are going on or to bypass statutory processes. So you see that, you know, there's been a lot of negativity towards the way that PIL is working in India at the moment. And I want to give you um, two examples of this, which will give you a flavor of where PIL is in India at the moment. So the first example has to do with a PIL in which um, someone asked the Supreme Court to order that cinema halls across the country play the national anthem before screening of films. And the Supreme Court said, the Supreme Court passed the order and the Supreme Court said, okay, everyone must stand up in respect until the national anthem has ended to, quote, instill a feeling within one of uh, a sense of committed patriotism and nationalism, right? Now, you know, you might think and that, okay, well, what's wrong with patriotism and, and some, you know, nationalism, that's a, that's a good thing. But then it really raises the question of, again, if you compare it to the Bandhu Amukti Mocha kind of a case where you've got these incredibly impoverished bonded laborers, which are, who are really in slavery-like conditions, whether, you know, if you can think of that, if you think of that as the paradigm case of public interest litigation, whether this is really a matter that we should think of as the focus of public interest litigation. But, you know, and, and this case, this particular public interest litigation, I think, tells you a lot about what's wrong with the PIL jurisprudence, because what we then saw is that the, the order had some really unfortunate consequences, in fact, some quite farcical consequences. So one consequence was that people who were not standing up were, were heckled and harassed. And there was even one case where someone who was in a wheelchair was harassed because the crowd around them said, oh, you're not standing up for the national anthem and, and so on. So it was really, um, it's had some really bad consequences. And in another case, to talk about how farcical the order has been, there was a back and forth in the orders in the court about what would happen in a film festival with 40 short films. Would people have to stand for the national anthem 40 times because the order was you have to stand before every film, right? So someone actually had to go back to court to ask this question, look, we have 40 short films. Do you want us to play the national anthem 40 times just during this one, you know, one short film festival that was lasting for a couple of hours? And initially the court said, yeah, stand 40 times and sing the national anthem if you if that's what you have to do that's what you have to do um and then it, it kind of backtracked so again if you just i mean this is what i keep doing in my mind you compare this kind of case to bandhu amukti mocha and you, it does raise the question of is this really what we as lawyers as members of the legal pr profession as as others who are contributing to these kinds of cases as judges, is this really what we ought to be spending our time and our resources on when there are many situations like Bandhu Mukti Mocha still out there? 
I mean, a particularly bad case of where PIL in India was dramatically misused um, was when one party used a PIL to go after a really well-known legal NGO. I mean, it's an NGO that many, uh, many of my colleagues, many people who work with me have actually worked with for decades. And this, th this NGO and the lawyers who head it, they have worked for the most vulnerable parts of society for really decades. And, and the two lawyers who, who headed there, I've put their picture up on their slides. So there's really a deep tragedy, but also a deep irony that public interest litigation, which formed, you know, it was public interest litigation that formed a strategy to harass people who had a long history of representing the public interest. So the very tool or one of the tools that they used to represent the public interest is now, you know, used against them in a very, with very, very, very dubious um, justification. So uh, the, the, another recent concern with public interest litigation is while the jurisprudence uses language of excluding busybodies, excluding interlopers and so on, and it's the same language that you see in other common law jurisdictions, including the Caribbean, in reality, as I mentioned before, a lot of people are granted public interest standing who are arguably really not representing the public interest. So the people that I have in the pictures here, they are frequent in the in the past, they were frequent litigators um, or people who were bringing petitions in the public interest and they were well known and you know their motivation was well known, their track record was well known. But today courts are actually granting standing to um, party political actors who are serving political or ideological ends and not just those with a good solid track record of vindicating the public interest um, who've been working for, uh, for instance, NGOs or community organizations for decades. So there's been a shift as well in who gets standing in public interest cases. And to add to these concerns about PIL, I said before that a part of the innovation of this jurisprudence involved the relaxation of procedural requirements and rules of evidence and, and fact finding. But again, this kind of flexibility, this kind of um, you know, this kind of openness to different procedures, this has also caused problems and invited criticisms because there are cases where courts have passed orders in PIL cases without hearing all affected parties. For instance, uh, in a PIL, in a public interest litigation about pollution from farmers who are burning stubble, the farmers were not heard. And so the court passed orders, despite the fact that the farmers were not hurt. And um, where we, we saw that commissions are sometimes used where litigants cannot prove facts, but at the same time, there are questions about whether the findings of these commissions are fair and accurate. So the court is making the case that the commissions are necessary because the litigants can't prove the facts, but you know, it raises questions about the nature of these commissions and how fair and accurate their, their findings are. And finally, you know, there was this, there were the heartening words that I read out up from the former chief justice about how members of the bar are willing to step up and act as amicus. Um, and that's true. So there's the heartening side of the, the, um, the practice around amicus. But those who are acting as amicus, at least in India, they are sometimes given, I would say often given actually, such a lot of importance that they completely displace the views and the perspectives of the petitioners and the affected party. So the amicus actually becomes the most important person in the whole uh, public interest litigation. So in short, 
I want to say that despite the fact that public interest litigation jurisprudence was fashioned to serve the most vulnerable, in recent years particularly, it's attracted a lot of criticism. And I think it's attracted a lot of criticism for good reason. So I don't want to say, okay, let's just throw the whole thing away. You know, I have I have some, some thoughts about what I would like to see in India. So I might move on then just to talk about... Um, um, what I think would be a better approach for India. Because despite the criticisms that I mentioned, I think there is value to India's practice when it comes to serving the needs of the most impoverished. I think I just think this practice needs some rethinking. It needs some fine-tuning. So I want to say a little bit about um, what kind of fine-tuning I have in mind. So first, I think it's important that courts are more discerning, more careful about who they grant standing to, because at the moment, it's really a range of people. And I think actually, Indian courts should attend much more to the character of the litigant, of the public interest, the person who's bringing the public interest claim, of uh, they have to pay attention to, I think, their expertise, their track record, their capacity and the potential that they have to be good public interest litigators, to be good public interest petitioners. And I think they just really have to have unimpeachable civic virtue. So I really want to see people who have served in community organizations, who have clearly served the public interest, who have shown themselves to have the right character and motivation. I want to see those people being granted standing in public interest matters, not necessarily the range of people that Indian courts are currently granting standing to. When it comes to the relaxation of evidentiary and procedural requirements, um, I think it makes sense in the case of impoverished requirements, uh, sorry, impoverished litigants, that you would relax these rules. But at the same time, I think the court absolutely should not and cannot compromise on principles like the need to hear all those affected. I think that's just so fundamental to justice. And again, you know, going back to the discussion we just had, I think rather than relying so much on ad hoc commissions, it seems to me that Indian higher courts should really involve trial courts or lower courts in fact finding, because this is, of course, their area of expertise. And that kind of connects to it, the discussion that we had last week, because an easy way to involve those courts more is by focusing on law that is not constitutional law. So for instance, administrative law, using administrative law matters, uh, using, uh, using statutory provisions instead of just the constitution means there will be more of a role for lower courts. They can play a bigger part in fact finding. And that I think would be preferable to the, the ad hoc commissions that the court very frequently um, sets up. And finally, you know, as much as senior members of the bar should be praised for their willingness to serve as amicus curiae, I think they should also be sensitized to the dangers and the problems of speaking for, of speaking on behalf of the most vulnerable people. Because I think this is something that we talk about in our communities. We know that, you know, it's not the right thing to, to speak for someone else, you know, like you're, you're the one who's taken the mic and you know their, their problems and their situations. We understand that that is a problem. And I'm not sure that the amicus who are very prominent in Indian jurisprudence at the moment, I'm not sure they're thinking about those issues as they should at the moment. So I would really like to see them being encouraged to give the most vulnerable, the most impoverished people, to give those people a voice rather than stifle their voices and speak for them. So I can, I can conclude the discussion on this first question that we are discussing today. The promise, I think, uh, of the early days of PIL in India has been somewhat tarnished in recent times. But I'm still 
optimistic about the value of the innovations that I've spoken about with some rethinking of how they are used and with some rethinking of the practice of public interest litigation as opposed to the jurisprudence itself. So I'll move on then to the second big question that I wanted to discuss today. That is, how are we going to, as you know, given the other shared challenges that we have of, of impoverishment, of lack of resources to some extent, and, and the challenges that administrators face and government faces in, in our jurisdictions, how do we effectively guarantee legal rights and entitlements? And I want to talk about four responses that Indian jurisprudence and Indian legal practice has offered to this question. Um, I want to talk about the use of continuing mandamus, of structural injunctions, and of quasi-legislative orders. And these are all kinds of remedies that the Indian courts, particularly the Supreme Court, uses and favors. And I also want to talk a little bit about how the how important the right to information has been in the Indian context, particularly in recent decades. So starting with continuing mandamus, I don't know whether this is a term that is familiar to some of you, but this refers to a remedy where the court continuously monitors a case. So the court will pass interim orders after interim orders, but it will usually not pass a final judgment. And so it just keeps passing interim orders to ensure that a public authority does its duty. And, you know, when I say that there are interim order after interim order, I mean, I am talking hundreds of orders, if not more, because in some of these cases, the monitoring actually takes place over decades. So just in the case, you know, to give you one example, MC Mehta, who is a, was a very, very prominent uh, public interest petitioner, one of the people who I had his photograph on the slide, in you know his case, MC Mehta versus Union of India, it was filed in 1985 orders are still being passed as of as of 2019 there were orders right and that is a case about the protection of the environment and pollution and so on so obviously it keeps coming up and courts keep picking it up um, and similarly you know the very famous case is called PUCL versus Union of India and that has to do with uh, the right to food and so again the right to food judgment so that it's not judgment sorry the right to food case right to food PIL you'll just find order after order that the court will give to various authorities, various governments to ensure that, you know, food is moved from this granary to this granary or food is supplied to these to these parties and so on. And so those kinds of orders we call continuing mandamus and they're really um, very common, very standard sort of approach that the court, particularly the Supreme Court, will take to um, to uh, public interest litigation. So another kind of remedy, and this isn't unique in India. I mean, it's um, it, there are other jurisdictions that adopt this kind of remedy. We can think of as a structural injunction. And what do we mean by a structural injunction? Well, it's really a combination of a number of different remedies and orders. So one scholar describes it like this, that it's a hybrid because it may consist of receiverships, it may consist as well of mandated policy reforms, of continuing judicial supervision, like the in the continuing mandamus, of information gathering, like the commissions that we talked about, and various types of dispute resolution outside the courtroom. And its general purpose is to alter broad social conditions by reforming the internal structural relationship of government agencies or public institutions. And I think that's that's quite an important way of understanding what structural injunctions are, because the court is really is not trying to say do this or do that. It's trying to change social conditions and it's trying to change the way that different parties, including government institutions, are working with each other. 
So I'll just take one example of a case which I mentioned actually last week. Um, and that, that case, I think, gives us a good example of, of a structural injunction. So the case is one of the cases that are called court on its own motion. So that already indicates that there is no petitioner. The courts just decided to take this case on. And in this particular case, the court was responding to a news article or news articles about the deaths of pilgrims who were on their way to a shrine in Kashmir. So the court looks at the newspaper, sees that these deaths have occurred, and then they appoint a commission to look into why this is happening, why are there these deaths, right? So that's one thing that they do. So that's one part of the remedy. And so you can see what the walking track looks like um, on the way to the shrine. And so you can see why it might be dangerous. And in that case, court on its own motion, the court actually passed 23 different directions. In some of these directions, the court was structuring and organizing the relationship between different state governments and uh, between officials and giving them really detailed uh, instructions. So for instance, and I'm just quoting here from the judgment, the court is directing the chief secretary and the secretary of health in each particular state to send doctors to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, where the shrine is. Um, so they're saying, you know, you should do that. And then it's saying, and then the court is saying, the state of Jammu and Kashmir has to write to the chief secretaries by the 30th of April of every year, all of these other states, all of these different states, making requisition for the number of doctors and the area of specialization from which these doctors uh, are required, right? So the court is basically coordinating and building a relationship, dictating the relationship between different state governments, different state officials, and really giving them very specific instructions, right, to so-and-so by the 30th of April every year. And I think when we spoke last week, I gave you already this example, but it should, I think that the orders give you a sense of how detailed some of these orders that form part of the structural injunction typically are. So the court says, okay, you have a walking track, it needs to be widened, and the railing and retaining walls have to be provided. And, you know, it's saying, we make it clear that the width of no passage shall be less than 12 feet. And there were other, you know, there were other instructions and details about the passage and the railing and so on. And then they say, okay, you, you need to provide a one-way passage for palkis and horses as one unit and the pedestrian, uh, pedestrian passage on the other near to the passage leading to the holy shrine. And they're saying that the passage should be preferably prefabricated and there should be matching, right? So it just gives you a sense of how detailed the orders are that the court is giving to these various government and uh, administrative actors. They're not just saying fix this problem. They're not just saying there's a safety issue, do something about it. They are going into this level of detail, which they are able to do to some extent, because if you remember, they appointed the commission and the commission gave them a report. And so they have all this information about the facts and the situation on the ground from this commission report. Okay, so, so far we've talked about continuing mandamus and we've talked about structural injunctions. The other kind of remedy that I want to talk about today is uh, one that the Supreme Court sometimes uses. And I think it's one that other common law courts would find a bit shocking. And I'd be interested to see what your reaction is. But I think of these as quasi-legislative orders. These are not, as I said, these are not the court's terms. The court calls these kind of orders guidelines. So they don't use the term quasi-legislative. But I think it's appropriate. And hopefully you will see why in a minute. So again, I mentioned this case last week of Vishaka versus State of Rajasthan. And this is a case where the court passed guidelines for employers to deal with workplace sexual harassment. And I want to show you what these guidelines look like, because I think it then becomes very clear why I'm describing them as quasi-legislative. So that's just one part of the guidelines. Um, <clears throat> here, the, the court is saying, 
it's identifying the duty of the employer to prevent and deter commission of acts of sexual harassment and so on. And, um, and then it has a definition section. It looks like a statute to me. I mean, I don't know if you have a different response. And then it goes on. I mean, I'm just, these are just extracts. It's really much longer than this. And then it contains really detailed duties on employers uh, on what steps they should take to prevent sexual harassment. And you'll see, you know, if you look at A to D, it's, it's really quite detailed. It's telling, it's telling employers what to do with reference to uh, other acts, other rules and regulations. And, and then it's also set up a complaint mechanism in section three or part three or whatever they call it. Um, and and the, the complaints mechanism is telling people how they can make an, how they can make a complaint, what the complaint body should look like and so on. So to me, this is, if you just look at this, and again, these are just extracts, this is very, very legislation like, right? So how does the court justify this it's so different from how we might think a common law court should uh, should act should decide well the court basically says in the case of vishaka versus state of rajasthan well women and any anyone else who's subject to sexual harassment or has a potential to be subject to sexual harassment they have fundamental rights to life equality livelihood and you would remember from last week those of you who were with us last week that these entitlements are read very broadly right so this this their starting position is people were in a workplace they have these fundamental rights and the next step is to say that okay we have these situations where sexual harassment results in violation of fundamental rights and people are bringing these cases to us for redress um what do we do as the Supreme Court? We have a situation where there is a legislative vacuum. And they have met, they mentioned that a number of times that, that the, legislat the legislature hasn't passed any law about sexual harassment. There is no legislation relating to this. So the court is saying effective redressal requires some guidelines should be laid down for the protection of these rights to fill the legislative vacuum. Right. Um, so if there was a piece of legislation, fine, we wouldn't, you know, we'd just say apply the legislation, but there's no legislation. So we, the court, have a duty to fill in that vacuum. And the other thing that may or may not be relevant here that the court mentions is that the government consented. So the progress made at each hearing culminated in the formulation of guidelines to which the, the Union of India gave its consent. But of course, the government is not parliament. So I'll just say you know, this might or might not be radical, but I'll just say that this is also not the typical remedy in an Indian PIL case because the remedy is often just directions to the government to honor existing uh, legal protection. And in fact, particularly in socioeconomic cases, courts, some people think, are quite timid in the remedy that they order. They will only really enforce existing statutory or other legal obligations. And we saw that in the case of Olga Tellis last week, where we discussed, um, it's a case about the right, rights of pavement dwellers, because there the court talked in grand rhetorical terms about the right to livelihood, but it didn't actually recognize a right for all the pavement dwellers not to be evicted without alternative housing. So even though the Vishaka guidelines I would say it is an accepted part of Indian Supreme Court jurisprudence. There have been guidelines in many other cases. I don't want to create the impression that this is what the Supreme Court always does. In fact, you know, they, they do offer different, different kinds of remedies. And finally, as a fi just in the final Indian response to the problem of how to effectively guarantee rights and entitlement, I want to talk about the right to information. Because the right to information in India, it was the, it didn't come about, just going back to some of the themes we've been talking about, it didn't come about by judicial development, but rather it came about through grassroots social movements around the right to food, the right to work, and the right to education. 
Um, and so today, the Right to Information Act is used by NGOs, used by citizens, used by activists as an accountability mechanism. I like the description that one scholar uses. He says, um, the right to information invokes a participatory discourse of active citizenship. Um, because I like that, I like that description because it reminds us that everyone, lawyers, judges, lawmakers, community workers, and citizens, we can all play a part in helping to realize and guarantee legal rights. And particularly when it comes to the right to information, we've had cases where villagers in India have used the Right to Information Act to get water access from the water board. That uh, right to information has been used in public interest litigation for housing rights of slum dwellers and in many, many other cases. So just by way of summary, these are the four approaches to guaranteeing legal rights that I wanted to discuss with you today. Each of them have both, I think, promises and problems. The three remedies in particular are obviously quite intrusive. So structural injunctions and quasi-legislative orders are not deferential to the executive or to the legislature, and they raise questions about separation of powers. At the same time, I can see the argument that these kind of remedies might be needed where the government or administration is ineffective or recalcitrant, or where there are very fundamental rights at stake. Because while the right to information regime has been very, very powerful in the hands of grassroots movements, unfortunately, the government has slowly chipped away at this regime. So it's under threat, really, at the moment in India. So here we have, and I think this is a theme of our discussion over the last two weeks, a highly imperfect, flawed set of responses to some shared challenges. I don't present these responses as a silver bullet or anything like that, but really having the potential at least to spark some new ideas about how we might all, I think all of us, change the law for the better. So I might end on that note and we might take um, another opportunity to just end by reflecting on what we've discussed with reference to our own jurisdiction. Mm -hmm.